Hello and welcome to Adobe Live. I'm your host this afternoon, Flynn, and I'm here with artist, designer, maker of things, which I really loved on your website, uh, Jonathan Zawada. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming on. Oh, pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Um, I feel excited to be in a legitimate establishment. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> yeah. We've got backdrops, yeah. we've got computers, yeah, exactly. microphones. We're all ready to go. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm somewhat ready. Hey, we're never completely ready. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so great to have you on. Um, I've actually been following your work for at least a decade. Um, so it's very nice to meet you and have you on here. Um, but how about for those people out, out there that may not be familiar with your work, how do you describe yourself today? Um, well, I think, as you said, I, I sort of settled on the idea of I like making things a few yep. years ago. I was uh, for a long time struggled with I start when I sort of started I, I very much saw myself as a designer a graphic designer or a, a commercial illustrator for a period um, but then I was sort of doing art shows so then there was that and and there was always this sort of push and pull about how I was defining myself and whether the design work was art or whether the artwork was design mm. and those sorts of things and and I went through any con number of different variations of which one I thought I was and why one was valid as the other um, and then I sort of looked back at what I'd been doing, especially over the last five to seven years, I suppose, and realized I'd done a ton of different stuff. And that's what I'm excited about doing is just making things, whether those mm. things are physical things or animations or films or graphic work or um, identity design or whatever it is. Um, I just like making stuff, which mm. I guess, and I guess it's generally visual stuff. Yeah. That's great. I love it. Nice big broad term. Yeah, not yeah. putting yourself in any particular box. No, because only because I know I'm. As soon as I put myself in a box, I'll get bored and frustrated. And you just have to move on to the next <laughs> yeah. thing. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, well, that's fantastic. So welcome everyone um, in the chat. We've got some people from Wellington. Hey, what's up, Festus? Welcome back. Um, so you can join the chat room and ask Jonathan any questions that you have through throughout today's live stream. Um, let us know where you're from as well. So you can log in using your Adobe ID. Um, just at the top where it says logged in, so your um, creative account, um, and then you can jump into the chat. Um, but we're here um, to talk a little bit and show some sort of behind the scenes stuff around the Adobe Lyrical Masters campaign um, that's happening right now. Um, and if you're not aware of it, we're gonna share a link in the chat room. Alex is gonna share a link for you guys to check out. It has the brief and all the information there, and there's some pretty cool prizes. Um, it finishes at the end of March, so March 31st is the cutoff date. Uh, we're gonna show you some of the behind the scenes stuff, give you maybe some tips and advice on your own designs, particularly if you ask a question, because we can answer it. Um, and then we're, we're gonna take a look at some of the entries as well. Um, and we're gonna play around in Photoshop and Illustrator. Yep. Some texture work, some type work. Yep, and sort of jumping around and some ideation and well, yeah, all that sort of stuff, I think. Hopefully we'll cover off. Perfect, excellent. Um, hey, from Sydney, Rianne from Australia. Cool, very good. And Joyce, hey, how are you going? So it's it's so great to see you all here. Um, so why don't we talk about this this tools down work that you did as part of this, mm -hmm. part of this competition. Um, and, and maybe like where you begin when you're at the very beginning. For those that yeah. are at home trying to think, how do I even begin to try to create artwork like this? Where do you begin? Yeah, well, so I guess the in terms of the project, I, I, I mean, the beginning for anybody doing design work is really the brief. And um, that's mm -hmm. where I, you know, that's the first point of entry and sort of understanding what the brief is and what the requirements are. Um, in the context of this uh, project for the presets, lucky for me, I've been working with them for about Oh, 16 years or something like that mm -hmm. since they very first started. So um, I feel like there's a lot of water under the bridge there and a lot a lot of the brief goes on said because right. it doesn't need to be There's a lot of trust. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> 16 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so starting with that point, um, you know, really for me it's just about then in, in this project, you know, the brief to me was designing the lyrics, tools down, pump it up from the clip. And for that obviously the starting point for any music project is listening to the music so that's what I did mm. and I'd already done that a lot from working on the album campaign as well so I knew the song pretty well inside out um, and and then I just kind of roll that around in my head um, sometimes consciously and sometimes I guess subconsciously if the time if there's enough time in the job generally I will try not to think about it um, I'll right. try and just sort of read it understand it think about a couple of quick things in relation to it and then go on with something else for the next couple of days if I can afford to mm. so that the I sort of my subconscious is maybe doing the hard 
lift, heavy lifting in the background. And then I, I tend like to that. find after a couple of days, I'll have a few little basic ideas and I'll sketch some stuff down in a notebook and, and then I'll kind of come back to that a few days later and kind of go back through those little rough ideas, see if there's anything feels right mm. um, and really try and dive in in a yeah sketching way just really really crude and really terrible ugly little sketches just figuring out what is the dna of the of this execution going to be or, or you know is there any little pearl in there that i can start sort of teasing apart into a full design wow um, so yeah that that's my process and then once once the sketching's done uh i kind of dive straight into software as soon as i feel like there's an idea there as soon as i feel like there's a something that's worth pursuing I'll start executing it. I'll kind of skip, you know, early on I used to do a lot of scanning that and then retracing it or, mm. um, you know, going through a lot more of a process there. But now I've, I have kind of just cut out that middleman and go straight into working digitally. Cutting out yourself as the middleman. I yeah, love yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so maybe we'll look at the artwork first. So we'll look at kind of, we'll go backwards. We'll look at sort of where, where you've ended up. Mm -hmm. So the final work on your screen. And yep. that's us. Yep. So that's tools down, which is super cool. We decided, what was it, pseudo isometric? Pseudo isometric, yeah, <laughs> yeah perspective, <laughs> which is like it proved to be a really fine line in, in terms of where it looked good and where it looked bad. So I had just, that's sort of the problem I always encounter with sketching is I'll do something that I feel like as a sketch looks very geometric, but because I'm so rough and crude, I, I, there's all these little tiny adjustments that I make in a sketch that, that let the thing work. And then when I try to draw it up by like rigorous geometric rules, suddenly nothing works. Something <laughs> breaks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So finding that little fine line with this of like, where's the, where is the, what's the deviation from proper ice, isometric perspective to, to mm. some other perspective where everything still works and reads. So, yeah, so for me, it was, you know, I, I was messing around with a bunch of stuff, but what I, I loved about this and what I really wanted to explore was this T um, element to start with. And once I kind of had that little rough sketch in my book, um, I felt like there was enough DNA there to, to really explore it. And, it. and especially sort of playing off this isometric perspective, being able to exploit this these really simple joins and simple right angles to get, you know, all of the required letters that are needed and then to doing something more playful with the S um, and having the, the nice little playful language with the circles and the pipes and that sort of thing. Um, you know, that, that, the DNA of that, I think, was in there from the beginning. I kind of always felt like this song felt a lot like Frankie Goes to Hollywood, that relax song. Right. You know, had yeah. sort of those sorts of elements. And so it's a, a bit like... Uh, that and I think somebody posted on Instagram as soon as they released this song the great that great bit from The Simpsons where they're in like some factory and they pull the steam whistle. Yeah, and we work hard, we yeah, party we, hard. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. So I, I kind of wanted that like tools down. All the pipes are on the ground and now everybody's somewhere else. Everyone's partying. Yeah, I love it. So obviously it reads tools down. It's it's pretty it's pretty far on the verge of. Um, legibility yes. which is this balance that yep. you know as a designer we need to try to get to yep. obviously you have artistic permission as well so you've <laughs> yeah, got your yeah, own yeah. artistic license in there yeah totally um, i often fall on the other side of legibility and it's like mm. my pet peeve and, I th and you know i've learned that the frustration for me is being a designer and having done this for 20 years my boundary for legibility is like way out there right <laughs> um but and so i get a kind of and then that, that's the challenging space for me like that's the exciting area is where is legibility borderline because that feels like the space where you can kind of create new things because mm. that sort of um by definition it's going to be new and feel new but you know then i just show it to a client and then invariably are like legibility is a bit of a worry right right <laughs> okay i can't believe i brought it up no no it's good <laughs> i mean it's very uh, apropos <laughs> um, I could talk to you about this design process stuff all day. Um, but why don't we sort of dive into how you might begin creating this project? Because mm -hmm. um, we're looking at this and it looks very vector art, but obviously there's a lot of texture as well. Yeah, yeah. So this sort of technique is something, uh, and jumping between Illustrator and Photoshop to kind of do a lot of illustration work, um, is something I developed quite a long time ago, maybe yeah, 10 to 15 years ago. I think when I started uh, working very, very young, when I was like 14, I was doing graphic design and sort of illustration work for local businesses and I had this opportunity to buy either an a, a regional airbrush, like a paint airbrush, or buy a secondhand computer. And that my attraction to airbrush air art has always been there. So um, trying to find ways to imbue some of those qualities, like 
I'm not a big fan of like fake fake textures and fake aging and all that sort of stuff. But at the same time, sometimes I feel like pure vector art is a little too cold and clinical. And mm. so, yeah, fi- finding that little middle ground. Um, I think a long time ago I ended up developing some techniques for jumping between Illustrator and Photoshop and transition and taking elements from one into the other just to give that little final bit of finesse that, that takes it out of pure, pure um, clean vector yeah. space. Adds a lot of character to it. I hope so. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, we can kind of, jumping back a little bit, I guess, is, is going back through some of the um, early rough sketches and, and crude ideas that I would start sort of from my sketchbook then try and transpose into Illustrator and, and see what's working and what's not. And um, so these are all a bunch of ideas that weren't working, but elements that I really liked and I, I wish I could have figured out a better way to get to work, like this this buzzsaw. A big buzzsaw yeah, is pretty cool. Which I was super into and I thought, <laughs> sure, this is it, I've got it. It's this buzzsaw D and I just could not get it to work at all. Um, I kind of liked this one, but it felt like it was a bit too... I don't know, unresolved and didn't really hold together in any way. Um, but there's sort of some elements there that ended up sort of sticking with it uh, and, and ending up in the in the finished one. I actually really, really liked this this S shape. Yeah. I think the most. Um, and then other other ideas like this, which are purely graphic. And I was actually super super into this. And I did show the guys from the band this one. I sort of gave them two options. They chose the the other one, which I was not all that surprised by. But um, mm-hmm. But this is, I was quite excited about this and sort of, actually a lot of my process uh, is in this where I, I had this L from something else that somebody didn't like that I I still really like. So I'm sure this L will turn up in a number of other things. And so in a previous project? Yeah, and it, yeah exactly. And yeah. it didn't make it to, to print or web or world exactly, or whatever. Yeah. And you kind of keep that. Totally. Somewhere. Keep it aside. I mean, I've, my process for a good 10 years, I think, was accepting that I would pitch something to a client, they would turn me down for that, and I would just put that off to the side, and invariably, six months later, I could take that and use it for somebody else, and they would like it, mm. I, either because I'd evolved a little more, or, I don't know, something had changed, that right. it was now palatable. <laughs> so, but yeah, I've never never thrown anything away, and I keep reusing elements, and you know, it's lovely, things like this, this L, I think has been sitting around for a, a good year and a half, and. Um, yeah, it'll pop up again, and it's just nice before having... it's time. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, or maybe just not refined enough. I feel like you know, maybe it takes a couple of years before I, I figure out what to do with it properly. You it's know? just a fine wine. It just needs to That's sit right. on the shelf for a while, <laughs> yeah, and age. when the time is right. Totally. So we're going to see that bandsaw in a project. For yeah, sure. yeah. For, That's yeah, coming back. It's yeah. too good to let go. <laughs> um, but yeah, but so yeah, I was into this, but yeah, uh, and this was fun to play around with. But um, yeah, didn't ended up going sort of with this one which is also super fun to play with Mm. so i guess breaking it down it's i mean as you can kind of see if i sort of switch it on it's pretty basic in terms of a of a construction in illustrator it's not that um complex you know using this this sort of clean geometry it's sort of recycling a few core elements and um you know shifting the perspective on them and that sort of thing but um so it's really really if I take out the T, um, you can kind of see it's just some simple gradients, uh, which I think are almost all are made from path blending. So they're all, they're all blended between two, two paths, and that way I can kind of control the gradient a little more easily and wrangle it into shape a little better than using the actual gradient tool. So um, that's this. If I expand it, you know, it become easier to see. So it's actually tons of lines, not... Uh, Oh wow! Interesting. It's not, not a proper gradient, gradient. But um, yeah, this is one of those things when I was doing like more commercial illustration and trying to do airbrush art. I found that using Photoshop and even using Wacom and stuff was a little too loose, and I wanted to control gradients better. Um, and so I developed this this thing of using the blend tool to construct gradients with it. Now I think there's some much more advanced gradients, especially in the new Illustrator, which probably negate the need for doing this, but I'm, I still sort of still stick to my old methods. Um, but yeah, and then from there, it's, it's really just sort of, you know, it was about just drawing up this, this circle shape, uh, basically with the ellipse tool and then cloning it out and, you know, putting it behind itself and, uh, doing some of this stuff sort of properly, sort of like by actual geometric rules and then some of it just really by eye and getting a, getting a feel for it. 
um, and then extruding out the elements. But sort of also keeping, as I go, keeping a little shelf over to the side, which they've all been deleted now, but a little shelf of all the basic building blocks so that I can just keep... I do that with logo problems. design. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I keep them off so I can look at everything really cleanly, but yes. I just need to be able to go back and think, actually, where did I start right. with all this? Yeah. What's the angle of this A or whatever Yeah, it is, yeah, so. exactly, and how to keep, especially for something like this, where, where is the, yeah, what's the proper angle for all of these lines to fall on? And, mm. um, you know, and by the time I get to the L or something, I know I'm going to have to deconstruct some of that. So, yeah, keeping all those elements off to the side and... Um, revisiting them as I go along um, and, and sort of just piecing things together. And then in terms of the process, I think, yeah, kind of kind of working compositionally at the same time, so work, you know, playing around with scale. And that's why I quite like, as soon as I feel like I've got the idea, I quite like doing it digitally because, you know, as opposed to having to re-sketch and sketch and sketch over and over again, um, you know, once I've got the T and that feels right, it's sitting there and then I can play with the size of the O's and see which where they feel right and try different ideas without having to redraw the entire thing every time. Mm. Um, so I really, you know, use this, use the final artwork as a sketching ground as well. Um, but yeah, it's pretty a pretty basic thing when you pull it all apart. But um, And, you know, it's kind of basic even when it's not pulled apart. But... But sort of these little nuanced little joins and things like that that are quite hard to get right and to get to feel right because they're not quite, you know, I, I could I do a lot of 3D work and something like this I could execute in 3D, but I think, mm. you know, all the charm in this and the reason why it works comes from all the little adjustments, the little human naturalistic adjustments you make to make it feel right and make it sort of sit on that legibility line and, um, yeah, where in... In 3D, where you sort of have stuck by hard and fast rules of actual geometry, you, it's much harder to fake stuff or fudge things and, uh, than it is in, in something like this, where I can kind of just tweak things to mm. to feel right and worry about more about the feeling than about whether or not it's actually correct. Um, so even I think stuff like this, you know, not quite lining up and. Um, yeah, I, I tend to get lost in a little hole with those sorts of little things and spend a good day shimmying little bits and pieces around um, to incremental degrees. Um, but yeah, even, I guess, coming into this sort of thing, you can see sort of these are all blended paths as well still um, to create all this sort of stuff so that I don't have to have a, a steady hand with a Wacom. Um, mm. I love to see how you did one of those blending. Yeah, so they're something like that, I guess, is... Uh, you know, drawing out a shape like that, and then keeping the same, trying to keep it with the same number of points. So quite often, I'll just clone it, uh, copy and paste it back in front, and then shift one of the points around uh, to something like that. Tweak that, and then just change the transparency on that object to zero, and then. I think it's command option B, blends between those two parts, and then in the blending options, we can sort of set how many steps you want to give it, um, and you end up with a nice little blend. That's really cool. And changing the path weight and stuff like that, so the, the, the stroke weight, so you get these sorts of the ends feeling neat. Um, just tweaking those little details. But then, yeah, what, what I love about that is, you know, I can, at a later date, I can come back and change if I feel like, oh, the S really is not legible enough. I can change the shape of the S and I can tweak the shape of that little shiny reflection on top mm. um, and it's not locked in um, as it would be. I think, you know, when I started doing this sort of stuff, I would do half of this process in Illustrator, get the basic shapes down, then bring it all into Photoshop and then do all of this stuff with, in, um, you know, with rasterized sort of airbrush tool. And then yeah. It was a nightmare every time I wanted to change something. Or the client. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wants I never to want to change something when the client <laughs> <laughs> wants to change something, exactly. Um, so, yeah, that's like, I, I, I still, the amount of, I feel like that's like my one Illustrator thing that I've like rung out in so many ways and I've used it for so much stuff over the years that it still gives me really fun surprising results um, you know and there's a bunch of album covers and all sorts of artwork that really hinges off I think I did a whole series of stuff with like fire where it was really fun blending between multiple colors and then um, expanding the the blended shapes you know doing sort of five steps expanding it and then tweaking the middle ones and then creating another blend from those right. and, 
getting really convoluted and quite complex blends of things that feel organic um, and, and sort of natural, but at the same time, are, are, they're all there in pieces for you to be able to tweak and change and mix with colours and all that and still have control over, um, which is great. So, yeah, so that's, that's that half of it. Um, and then I guess we've got the, the pump it up half, which is... So, I mean, well, I guess to finish off this, this tangent, so once I've kind of constructed, I guess, all of the, the key shapes here and then I've built the shadows in and, and got the, the vague feel of it right, I tend to do the colour work in Photoshop. And yeah, that was my next question, stuff. is at what point do you bring your colour in? Because the examples you showed us before of the, the more graphic design, brutalist -y kind of stuff, yeah. that, that, all, that was all full of colour as well. Yeah. Um, so do you design in colour fairly early on? Or do yeah, you... I mean, I think something like that was really like, where are we here? You know, these are like placeholder color, vague ideas of color variation, right. um, but n not necessarily. You know, if, if this went ahead, not probably none of these colors would stay. They'd all get tweaked and changed. But um, you know, one of the my, the things I love the most in the world is the hue and saturation adjuster that's mm. in Photoshop. So I tend to do a lot of that color stuff there. Um, you know, there's the great uh, the color editor in Illustrator, which is I use all the time as well from this but um and and also this this one which is great mm. uh for tweaking these sorts of things but i kind of love not have i love there's a line of control that i really like so the arbitrariness of the hue the global hue and saturation adjustment is i love like where i can just shift everything and quite often i'll shift everything and say those three colors are great that color is terrible and then i'll go back to illustrator change all the colors to those right. and then tweak that one last color until it feels right and do it all again and go over and over and over oh, again. I and like that iterative process. Yeah. That you just keep going until it's right. Yeah. And really it's like never that. right. It's always no. just a spot where, I, the, where the, the music stops and <laughs> I sit down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the deadline is looming. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, so the, and in terms of getting that out of there then uh, and being able to do that and getting sort of all, all this texture in Photoshop, then uh, I'm sure, again, there's probably a better way to do this now, but I kind of, I did a, the way I started a, a lot of the work I did early as a graphic designer, and even the, work, the very first work I did as a kid when I was sort of 14 was making screen printed t-shirts. So I did Every to, graphic designer, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's how I still think, you know, I still think in terms of screens when I'm doing graphic mm. work. Um, so for something like this, um, it's kind of a, it is a, sort of an involved and semi-laborious process but I'll kind of take out each element I'll, I'll re-clone the entire piece of artwork and then using the edit, edit colors tool so I can sort of show you roughly this won't be exactly right but um I'll go and I'm sure again there's a better way to do this but I'll basically turn that one black and make everything else Wow, let's slow down just oh, a sorry. little bit. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I was just doing some little settings there. So uh, I had to switch off this preserve white and preserve black um, right. so that they become available to me. Otherwise, uh, I, switch, see. I, can't, I can't adjust them. And then changing this from colors to whatever, it sort of just picks some number of colors and changing it to all so that I've still got all of the colors available. Excellent. Um, and then what I'll do is say I'm making the screen for this bit of um, cyan here. Let's keep that one. Uh, turn that black and basically turn everything else, put every other color into the white column. And if I turn off the background, what I effectively end up with is a screen for just for the cyan. Um, and so I do that color by color. And, and I've actually, this is something I never do, but I did in this case, I labeled everything. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> really People helpful. always do get bonus points if they label when they're on right. here. So yeah, get you something nice on the way out. Thanks, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's always important to label your files. Very, yeah. I, I do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it sort of then you end up with yeah, a layer for each color. Um, and from that point, I can then export the entire thing, which is this is another great thing that's happened in I guess when I started doing this technique it was yeah a good 10 years ago and I think at that point the only way to get stuff to get this sort of you couldn't export from Illustrator to Photoshop very easily with preserving layers so I'd have to like export each individual thing by switching stuff on and off but right. you can um, just save the whole thing as a Photoshop file 
uh, and it'll preserve all of your layers. And then again, I've even laid them in here. Uh, they'll come in basically into Photoshop as just the same layers with the same names uh, as black and white sorts of things there. And then I will just piece by piece use each of those, copy and paste um, each of those, sorry, sort of copy and paste that into a new solid color um, and paste it as the layer mask for that solid color. So if I turn that off, what else have I got on here? You can kind of see there. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's just the shadow. So that, that's, you know, directly out of Illustrator. And that the reason for doing all this is exactly why it looks a bit janky at the moment on screen is because it has a dissolve trans... or whatever that is, layer Overlay. transition. Over, yeah, is that what it's called? I never know exactly the term for that. But, um, yeah, it's set to dissolve, which uh, is that sort of nice speckly, yeah. airbrushy... Yeah, gritty. Or, yeah, mm. and makes it feel like a sort of like an old film poster or something as well. Or, you know, there's just a little bit of something there that also helps, you know, for other... in, an, in You know, it has that one element where it's nice in terms of feeling a little more tactile and um, a little more warm, but also helps with banding and some other stuff like that when, a, you know, when they're doing stuff with big uh, colour gradients and things like that. Sometimes you get the, that weird banding stuff, so... Um, that kind of eliminates that. The only problem with it is uh, when you're previewing, so if I, you can see all these colours, which I haven't labelled. Um, <laughs> there goes your bonus prize. Yeah, sorry. Uh, if I switch them on, you could, that's what the mask looks like just for the for the shadows, for the black. Mm. Um, and the only problem is that unless it's flattened, I think it, it rasterizes it based on the resolution of your, the screen, the zoom of the screen, not of the actual artwork piece. So you kind of have to um, flatten it all to see what the fine or uh, speckle will look like, the scale right. of that speckle. So I used to, when I do this quite often, you know, generate the artwork at like 300% of the final size so that that speckle becomes almost imperceptible, mm. like really, really fine. Um, but yeah, and then you can see I've still got a little hue and saturation adjustment here that I obviously didn't delete that I was messing with at some point. So I've sort of got everything in there, uh, but with the ability now to yeah add some of the texture to it and then also play with the hue and saturation or you know individually change colors um, as I'm going and just sort of tweaking tiny, tiny little things. Like I think there's probably a, a slight variance in there with this nice aqua rather than being pure cyan and this gold came out of this um, process as well. So it just sort of allows me to focus more on those elements without getting distracted. I feel like if, I, if I'm if i in Illustrator and I can mess with shapes and forms as well, mm. I probably will. So it kind of compartmentalizes my thinking a bit at the same time. Um, and this is a silly question maybe, but do you work in CMYK or RGB? Well, RGB for this, knowing yep. that that's what it was going to be. Mm. Um, and then sort of what we're talking about in terms of the screen artwork, I live in an optimistic world for a lot of stuff and assume that somebody's going to pay for a special. Somebody's <laughs> going to make a shirt out of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Especially, I mean, doing music stuff, it was like always so useful for me to start this way because it would always end up becoming a T-shirt right. you know, or would end up becoming a poster or something like that. And mm. reverse engineering artwork to screen print on a T-shirt is when it wasn't made for that, is like nightmarish. And the results are always terrible um, unless you have a really great screen printer or, you know, mm. someone who can do really awesome separations. But um, so that was always super useful for me to be able to think in those terms, generate everything from the ground up, knowing that like screen printing is kind of the, the worst, you know, the like lowest fidelity execution that I have to allow for. Right. Um, and, if and in I terms could, of like laborious steps to make something look yeah, really good. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that there's not going to be, you know, if I build it with that, knowing that from the ground up, there's not going to be some element that I can't reproduce mm. or um, that somebody's not going to feel happy with. So even stuff like, you know, the background, a lot of this stuff ends up floating on backgrounds as well for that same reason, because potentially it ends up on a t-shirt right and there's no there's no comp and the compositions are sort of loose for the same reason because there's no compositional boundary to a t-shirt so it's hard to um you know you can't just put something in the i mean you can kind of put it in the left corner but it doesn't do the same thing as if on a printed page or a poster in the top left corner or the bottom right or you know those sorts of things um whereas these kind of amorphous forms that bleed out 
sort of lend themselves to being printed on t-shirts pretty easily. Yeah. Do, do you ever sort of bleed things completely off the page or do you like to keep things in that in that environment where, you know, obviously this could yeah. go to a poster and be part of... Yeah, that's there, a good question. Sure. I do like keeping that in con- sort of all contained in there so you see everything. But actually, mm-hmm. to be honest, I love looking at the reverse. <laughs> oh, think, wow. Yeah. I think that's probably me not... You know, not like feeling like, well, I've done the work. I want you to see all the work. All of it. Yeah. You want it to bleed off the yeah. page. Yeah. But in actual All the good fact, stuff. In, in yeah. <laughs> it probably would be a better thing if it was, you know, if there were elements that were cropped out or, or lost in the corners. Um, we had a question from uh, from the chat about menus. So you're moving around pretty quick there. Oops, sorry. Um, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. But obviously because you've, you've done it so often. So one of the questions was, um, do you still use the menus or are you all shortcuts? Yeah, no, I still use the menus a fair bit I've um, especially maybe the last five six years I tr- I jumped to PC or maybe six seven years ago mm-hmm. jumped over to PC and have been I use the two things but I'm not the sort of person to have I know you can very easily change your shortcuts so that they're universal but I'm too lazy to do that so I know the shortcuts for both but um, because I'm always jumping between the two of them I still do rely on the menus a fair bit mm-hmm. um, but I do use contextual menus and right click menus quite a lot as well um, and yeah, there's some things I've learnt and I, I use constantly and I do try, you know, I, I make a point of reading the little hint um, when, I, when I see myself using a menu because I know it's only going to be beneficial to do it. I think there's like an inherent laziness in me that's like my brain does a little computation of like how long is it going to take to sc- move the cursor up there and pick the menu item right is it worth the effort and so <laughs> if i can avoid that then i feel like then i'll probably try more things and do and use more of the tools available mm. um but yeah. yeah yeah it's a difficult one and it's like jumping between software i mean you know within adobe at least everything's pretty universal or the shortcuts are pretty universal but then i'll jump into some other software and like it's a whole other world like i use 3d stuff that like everything's every single thing is different and mm. you select with a right click you don't select with a left click and right. um, all that sort of stuff so but uh but yeah i kind i kind of like that too you know i like jumping around and i like i don't know i think i feel like it keeps me thinking about what i'm doing as well if i'm if i'm actually participating and reading the menus and actually reading the menus is great for like especially cuz now there's so many new there's updates every couple of months or whatever there's mm. i'll just sort of see something I haven't seen before and keeping up. That's, click the, on it. that's, yeah. that's the hard thing. Keeping yeah. Up with all, all the updates, there's so much that you can learn, so much. Totally. So yeah. many new tools. Yeah. So I think being inquisitive about those menus is a good thing as well and just like clicking on stuff and seeing what happens and hoping that you don't just have to restart because you can't find how to undo it. Or whatever. <laughs> Have another question. Um, is there another way to do the shiny effect on the gooey thing? <laughs> ah, <laughs> Which I love that it's a gooey thing. Such yes, a good description. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I bet there. I bet there is. I don't know. I think um, you know. There's there's automated ways of doing stuff like the uh, what are they like the the sort of inner drop shadows and inner those sort of what are they called the like blending modes or yeah. something like that. Um, so there are, there's definitely a bunch of shortcuts like for. Uh, I don't even know where they are because I, I think I use them for some things, but I, I don't use them very often. Um, mm. And I guess for me, the, the, those things are great, especially when you're roughing something out as an idea. It can be really useful to like switch on the drop shadow mm. and see what it looks like or s- switch on the inner glow and see what it looks like. But um, it's never quite, it never feels quite right. There's always some edge case somewhere in the design where it doesn't feel quite right. And so I end up, preferring to construct it all from scratch. Um, but there's definitely, you know, quick ways to do that. And then and it sort of comes back to what we we're saying as well with the in terms of the isometric thing where that those sorts of automated methods are like universally true and are right. But and I sort of learned this looking at lots of airbrush stuff where when I was younger and it was like, I oh, actually the thing that makes this so charming is not that it's not actually real. Like it's yeah. not quite right. And they've pushed this and tweaked that and and those are the elements which make it feel really attractive. Um, and and when it's sort of just an automated filter, it's sometimes too perfect, and it, it lacks that. I guess that's you know part of what art is is like picking an element and pushing it forward or pulling back on something mm. else. Um, and yeah, when it's an automated filter, there's there's not a capacity to sort of push and pull in that nuance. It's just kind of a universal thing. Um, but but yeah, it is super useful to use as a 
quick way of seeing an effect. That's so cool. I think me, like some other people in the chat room, I kind of want to go home and try out blending again. It's I'm the trying best. to remember the last time I've, I've used it, but I've never used it to such a fine detail where you couldn't recognize it as right. a blend. Yeah. Um, so it's such an interesting perspective. It's not something I would have guessed. Right. And, and I mean, it's great now because it's fine and I can do tons of them. When I first used it, my you know the compute, my GPU was too slow. Oh, and, yeah. yeah. It would like max out. So I have, have to, to <laughs> move to PC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so I had to like totally do one one element at a time and flatten it and because it would not handle, you know, 100 or 200 elements that were all filled with thousands of blending paths. Mm. Um, well, we'll answer this question while we're here. Um, but if you're just joining us uh, here at Adobe Live with Jonathan Zawada, if you do have a question, you can log in using your Adobe ID in the top right-hand corner. That's why I'm pointing. Um, it's reversed. Whoops. Um, and jump in and ask your question. So we're going to be here for about another 25 minutes. So if you do have questions, now's the time. Um, so we have a question from JB. Um, how did you start working with the preset? Ah, that's, I actually started with them when they were a different band called Prop, or the, they were two ah. members of a different band called Prop that was like a, a proggy band. Um, they were all out of the conservatory of music. And I think the, uh, for the for Kim and Julian, Presets was like their little little side hobby and they thought we're just gonna, we wanna try our hand at writing some pop music. So they did that on the side, but I had made a, a website for the band Prop in Flash and it was like oh, a wow. big spinning, pseudo 3D thing that was all really involved back in the days of like those sorts of websites. Yeah, yeah. the Wild Wild West. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is what I did at the time and I was a web designer for um, for ages. Like I started, you know, I did I did illustration and, d and sort of design work as a kid mm. um, but I also worked in an animation studio after school and um, and but my proper job, I sort of did like six months of uni and dropped out because I had a proper job at a web design company and for maybe five years that's predominantly what I did was web design and actually a chunk of that was like coding and connecting with databases wow. and um, and even just like maintaining really terrible online shopping websites and stuff. Oh, like right. And doing banner ads and all that sort of stuff. So dealing with hosting and yeah. all that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. Shoes up my spine. <laughs> yeah, but it was great. I mean, it was like the, the presets is a perfect example and for the longest time I could see how every job adhered to this rule where I could do a really practical thing at that time, which not, you know, now everybody can build a website or lots of people can build websites. But mm. um, at that time it was pretty specialized still or, and especially the scale I was working at, there were lots of people that could build you a website for a lot of money. There weren't many people who would be willing to build you a website for not much money. Mm. Um, and so having some really practical technical skills like that is how I met the presets is how I met a ton of bands. It's how I met a ton of fashion designers that ultimately I'd end up working with designing prints and art directing campaigns and doing much more creative work, um, but really started with a you know, very, very pragmatic, quite non what I would feel like now would be non-creative web design and was right. you know not what I thought of as design but but I was just excited to be working and I, and I loved it so it's yeah. Fine. yeah yeah it's funny isn't it so talking about leaving school to have a real job so I to do anything yeah you know, <laughs> getting paid to do <laughs> yeah. my job to what, what I've been you know what I love to do which yeah. is great uh, <coughs> sorry excuse me we'll do one more question Gigi was asking um, what school university did you attend in order to learn these skills um, so I did do six months of a degree of Bachelor of Design degree at the University of New South Wales, mm -hmm. but I think I really only attended for like the first three months, and okay. then I got a job. Um, and part of that at that time, you know, that was like two thousand or something, and I think only one of the units out of eight or ten or whatever involved a computer, and it was like teaching very basic stuff. But by that point, I'd probably been using building websites and, and using three D and all that sort of stuff since I was like fourteen, fifteen. Mm. So I'd had years of doing it anyway, and I felt like that was a bit. It felt a bit slow. So really everything I've learned, I've really taught myself and I've just sort of been interested in it. And mm. um, and then especially in the last, you know, I did 3D when I was young and then I took a break and then I've revisited it and been doing a lot of that for the last eight to ten years as well. Um, but the thing I've realised in that is how amazing communities are now, online communities, right. and, mm. and how much, uh, how accessible it is and how easily you can learn stuff. So... Um, yeah, I think m most of it is just like, there's nothing better for me than like having a client <laughs> ask you to do something and then you have to figure out how to do it. And, you know, they don't accept you 
doing a poor job of it or not you're just not submitting it you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. not turning up yeah yeah so there's a really good impetus to learn a bunch of this stuff for me to learn about any number of these processes and um and and plus just being you know interested and inquisitive i think and curious mm. that's cool um keep those questions coming guys we'll come back to it um, but I thought maybe we could jump into that other artwork yeah. that you had because you've got the tools down kind of hero image and now we're pumping it up. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> which is, is the second frame. Which is great because you were sort of talking how this is almost an evolution from the original one yeah. in and of itself. Yeah. And there is a bit there is a bit more going on. Yeah, exactly. Here. So where, where tools down is really literally things are laying down on the ground. Um, pump it up was like everything's floating in the air. Um, all that isometric thing is out the window because everything's skewed and bouncing mm. around and um, the elements are all still there. The, little, the spheres and the rods and all that sort of stuff is still present, but now it's all alive. And then with that comes sort of more individualized color, a bit more pattern, um, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, you can still kind of see some of the same. I'm not sure. Actually, this is a totally different way of doing the the fills on this, the gradient fills for the for the airbrushiness. Um, trying to see how how exactly I did this, but I think it's sort of some some clipping paths with some other nested elements. That's a bit convoluted, but um, <laughs> but these pattern pattern blocks and things like that, which I, I love messing with uh, the the pattern libraries. Um, I think it's in libraries. Yeah, I'd love to see how you made these patterns. Palettes, I think. Well, I just took the default ones. Yeah. <laughs> um, so oh, it's not in patterns. Sorry, it's in swatches. That's where it is. Not in symbols either. Swatches. There we go. So these are all great little swatch libraries. There's tons of awesome mm. prepackaged swatch, swatch libraries. You can also, um, I haven't done it in a while, but you, you know you can download or make your own swatch. There's so many, and, yeah, yeah, available. And pretty much the good thing is everyone's everything's pretty much free these days yeah. as well. So yeah. there's so much out there. There's more than you'll ever use. Totally. Mm. Yeah. And and the like for me the the basics have been like never ending sources of stuff you know just playing with scale and stuff in sort of these these essentially just these three are the three that I use the most oh wow um, dots lines and, and textures um, and just playing with the scale of them so I'm trying to make that a large list view I guess um, yeah and just and and dropping those in. I'm, I'm sure there's a better way to do this, but the, one of the things that I found frustrating really early on with this was that they come in black, and I'm sure there's a better way to do this, but I always use the edit color, recolor artwork thing to change that. I'm not sure if there is a more efficient way to do that now. But Can we show that one again? Because I think there might be a lot of people that don't actually know that one. So you've, uh, yeah. s you've selected... So select the object mm -hmm. um, and maybe select a few because it's kind of nice. And by people out there, I mean me. <laughs> oh, I, I need yeah. to be able to learn how to do this at home. <laughs> um, this is also good for like unifying stuff. So you can yeah. see I've got like two slightly different oranges here. Um, so you can it, basically that that this was wasn't present a long time ago and was like such a good addition. I feel like um, where there's two different ways of manipulating your colors. You can sort of assign, and that's really more granular and specific, and you sort of shows you every color from all of the objects you have selected. Uh, which are the colors that are present there, and you can change them via sliders, which I think you can change from, yeah, RGB or hue, saturation, balance, CMYK, mm. those sorts of things. I think you can even randomize, um, and oh, which wow. I use a lot. Now we're really pumping Yeah, up. randomize is awesome <laughs> <laughs> for anything, but especially yeah. in this. And then you can shuffle, I think this shuffles tones or something like that, or brings them into, like, what it considers to be tonal harmonies, but um, I never consider those to be tonal harmonies. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's super useful for then, you know, like, so you can see that the pattern was the black and you can change it just like Great. this, which gives you a lot more control. And again, sort of like what we were saying before, it's like a nice way of just isolating that process and, you know, doing it um, back out from there, being able to do it to everything as well. Uh, all at once and see some like dramatic I feel like one of the other key processes with this sort of stuff is you can spend the better part of a day crafting all of these little elements mm. um, and then I kind of my eyes get tired of it and I just kind of want to see a dramatic change and mm. this is really useful for that and sometimes gives you quite good ideas as well about like you know I think especially this sort of stuff and when I've done this sort of stuff a lot in the past 
a kind of, there's a whole lot of heuristics and rules of thumb that I fall to of like highlights should be this or highlights should be right. that or, um, you know, all the highlights should be white because it's a white light. So it's doing this and the shadows would be this. And, and then I do this kind of thing and I'm like, well, that's true, but this just looks cool. This looks cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, as you yeah. said, you want to do, if you want to do something different, you kind of have to. Yeah. You kind of have to kind of go a bit extreme and then maybe try to pair it back yes. rather than starting with what works and then pushing it. Yeah, you know, so yeah, It's exactly. just a different way to go about it. Yeah, and just sort of, I don't know, refreshes my brain a bit, like, mm. you know, and depending on my mood as well, I think. Because I, I think sometimes it's hard to know when you, or it can be hard for me to know towards the end of doing something like this, what, what are the elements that aren't working anymore or are weak? And mm. quite often doing something like this, just shuffling the colours or doing even the, the hue shift, I find... Is really highlights where the weak area is. You know, some some zone of it might feel really samey, and mm. and you don't notice it when it's a certain palette. But when you sort of shift everything around, you kind of suddenly see which bit doesn't feel right, and then you can tweak that. And even if you don't use that color variation or whatever, at least you you know where that area is, and you can just change that one little element and um, you know fix that sort of thing up, which is which is great. Um, Plus, it's a really useful way to like very quickly say, "Here, I did a bunch of variations for you." Oh, to right. Yeah, <laughs> we want to see. We want to see eight variations. Great. No Here's problem. Your eight variations. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Press the button seven yeah. times. Export. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Perfect. It is really. Imp- it is super important, though, isn't it? Like, yeah. Just to to work in that. We talk about working non-destructively. Right. As well, a lot, which is, you know, as we were chatting a little bit before we sort of went live, we were talking about the old school way we had to do some of this yes. stuff. Yeah. And then you've got to work backwards. Just think, like, you're just going to be sitting there doing this grunt work for a couple of days. Yeah. Sometimes weeks. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Just to make sort of some, some sort of small change. So it's so important to arrange your files and work in a non destructive Oh, absolutely. Manner. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. That's like my favorite thing in the world is yeah. non destructive <laughs> editing <laughs> and, and tweaks. Anything where I can do it, um, you know, which is a vote in favor of like those the effects and things like that. Anything where you can do it where it's not it's not set in stone is like is awesome. Um, and and quite often with this sort of stuff, you know, my file will end up having a ton of variations in the layers. I don't think any of them are present here, but I'll just keep cloning out the layers and changing and cloning and changing and cloning and changing until you know one of them is the actual artwork the other 14 are variations and right um yeah and then you can always sort of shuffle those elements too which is great um got a couple of questions maybe we'll we'll do that Mm -hmm. um so joyce is asking what are your design inspirations that's Uh, interesting yeah um it's i think i they were designers for a long time you know people like peter seville and Mm -hmm. um and especially in the context of album cover artwork, like a ton of amazing album cover designers like Hip, Hip, this company called Hypnosis from the 70s. Um, oh. and there's a, another company called Me Company, which was like hugely inspiring to me as a kid in the 90s. I don't, unfortunately, they don't, don't exist anymore. But um, yeah, a, a lot of that stuff, I think early on was really inspirational to me. Mm. Now I've sort of, my life is like, I don't live in a city anymore. I have kids and I don't spend any time on the internet at all and I don't really look at anything. Um, so it's really, I think, and this is, you know, I think having accrued 15 to 20 years worth of working, um, I don't feel like I need to look for inspiration anymore. It sort of right. just comes as, and I used to say that this was the process, but I don't think this was actually true until <laughs> maybe the last few years, that uh, the inspiration is really in the problem. So like something like this, the inspiration is buried inside the brief and buried inside the music. I love that. You know? I love that. My design teachers would love to hear Right, yeah, that. yeah. And it's yeah, so easy to say. In the brief. <laughs> yeah. But 20 years and having such a, such a career in so many different, with so many different touch points, yeah. in so many different areas, art, yeah. design, technology and everything. To, to be there 20 years later and to say, yeah, it's, it's actually right there. It is, yeah. yeah. But, you know, at the same time, I can look at this and recognise the inspirational artwork that I've seen in of that 20-year period yeah. that, that fed into this as well. And mm. um, so, yeah, it's, I think, yeah, early on was definitely about looking at a lot of stuff and exposing myself to a lot of stuff and just mm. having an appetite for that. So back, back then it was, you know, pre the internet being particularly good, so that was a ton of books and... Um, that was sort of my exposure to it, especially like getting to go somewhere like Japan or something and just buy a, an absolute ton of books while I was there and bring them all back and then have, you know, years where that would be my mm. like palette of inspiration to draw from. Um, to now, 
sort of, or, you know, I went through a long period where I just have a f one big mammoth folder full of now thousands and thousands of images, which started off as inspirational design images, and now they're quite often like just odd images or odd products or right. odd things that I just think are fascinating, um, animals and stuff like that, and they all end up in this folder that is my my wall, my desktop backdrop, and that changes every minute or something. So if I am just sitting down thinking about another thing, that's ticking over there too and, and it's sort of you know one thing pops up and another pink thing pops up and it, I feel like that kind of triggers some some if not any concrete ideas at least triggers me to think about problems in a slightly different way it's really nice I love the idea of getting inspiration from non-design stuff as yeah. well because yeah. I'm quite part of this design community and we talk to each other and hang out with each other and and we've definitely had some some designers illustrators also here that have that have said similar sorts of things you know just to make sure you get out of that that bubble yeah um, and make sure you look for other areas for inspiration it could be music yeah. shapes colors yeah, yeah wherever it is no totally and yeah. i think it is just about you know having a palette once you've got a big enough palette of inspiration you can draw you draw smaller bits from each thing mm. and then they become more unique whereas Early on, I think the challenge is, is executing any piece of design is sort of a big task involving form and colour and shape and all these sorts of things that, you can, you know, and if you don't have that library in your mind of, other, of pre-existing stuff, figuring out how to execute on all of those things, like just the form and colour and shape of something all being embedded into one element and composition, you know, where do you start if you don't yeah. have stuff to draw upon so um yeah that's challenging early on but i think that's why you know for me early on it was really i was just copying lots of stuff and yeah. stealing lots of stuff so. that's cool yeah <laughs> that's all good we all do that um and so lindor was asking slightly unrelated but what was your process with the artwork for hi this is flume ah uh, so it's a tricky one because that doesn't come out till tomorrow so i'm not i'm not sure what i'm allowed to say about oh wow that. <laughs> um, um but we can skip that one if you want yeah, yeah, we might have to we'll skip, skip it because we'll I feel like that if one. I say anything, someone will I'll get a phone call. Skip from that one. Sneaky maybe. question. Yeah. <laughs> then, <laughs> very good, nice try though. Yeah, <laughs> really good, really, really good. Um, Gigi was asking last question, then we'll jump to some some. Um, well, maybe we'll check out some of the submissions for the competition as well. Great. Um, so Gigi was asking, when and what age did you realize that you were interested in this type of creative design? Um, I, I think I realized after I was already doing it. I really didn't know there was a job. Of designer, mm. but I was doing it a long, uh, for a long time. So, like, I can remember back to being twelve, and we didn't we didn't have very much money. So, but I loved video games, and my friends had things like Mario Kart and Sonic and stuff like Amazing. that. But we didn't have any consoles or anything like that in our house. So, I would spend ages crafting my own like board game versions of them by drawing the, all of the little pieces and. And like obsess, I was obsessed with the NBA as well, so I'd obsessively redraw all the logos for all of the teams on these playing pieces for the board game and that sort of stuff. Um, and as it, as time went on, I think I kind of thought I was going to do something maybe more in animation because um, mm. that's what I was drawn to and, and cartoons and things like that. Um, but yeah, it wasn't really until after I was kind of doing it, sort of, uh, you know, only as a kid and only very part time, um, sort of doing the odd piece of design work for people that I realised that it was actually its own job and that you could actually... And then I kind of gradually put the pieces together and figured out what the job was. It's amazing to me how bit, how different design is. I'm sure you notice this too, like how, mm. what, what a different animal design is now to... You know, I think I, I was at the tail end of when design was um, very practical and you had to physically... You know, like a lot of my friends who are designers yeah. and a little bit older talk to me about making bromides and you know, actually, yeah yeah and, yeah and at that point i think you know that that's a huge barrier to entry and i think yeah that as soon as computers came in design turned into quite a different undertaking so yeah for me when i started uni I was definitely on the cusp of that transition and um you know i, I was very much drawn to the previous version of it and, yeah um whereas now yeah it, it's such a totally different animal and, and sort of it is what it always was which is it's in everything but i think mm. it's much more obvious now that it's in everything yeah and constantly changing yeah. obviously yeah as well okay cool well um so i thought that maybe we could check out some of the submissions that we've already got so far for the um, adobe lyrical masters campaign if you're just joining us and you don't know what we're talking about um, there's an amazing competition that's running at the moment um, called the Adobe Lyrical Masters, and we'll uh, share a link in the chat to that. 
Um, it finishes on the 31st of March, so that deadline is coming up pretty soon. Um, and the best way to submit your work is through the website. Um, but once you've done that, there's also a hashtag that's available so we can check out your work. And we're going to have a look at that that now. Yeah, tab over and oh, I was already scrolling through some of these. So my first instinct is this is a lot of cool, exciting colors. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, these are great. This one looks amazing. <laughs> like, that's awesome. I love that. I don't know what the lyric is. The eat, the is eat. I mean, I love that. See, this is the legibility thing we were yeah. just talking about. Yeah, you've got a kindred spirit. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, that looks amazing. The heat is on. Oh, the heat is on. Is it heat? Yes, probably is heat. I cheated. I read the, uh, oh, you read the, I read the description. <laughs> <laughs> I like the heat is on as well. Yeah, <laughs> the heat is on. It's cool. I mean, that's that, really great. That's awesome. I love how, like, this sort of stuff is totally not what, I haven't looked at any of this yet. So, um, mm. yeah, I totally wasn't expecting this sort of, work which i feel like this is super sophisticated yeah and, yeah you know compositionally really challenging and interesting and um and you know the execution with like all these lovely blends i, I bet he, whoever did this knows how to do a way more efficient version of my stippling <laughs> <laughs> than i do um which is amazing let us know if your work's in here as well guys yeah if you recognize your work i'm sure i can pull these yeah, and that's great as well. <laughs> I mean, I love this little face. Like anything where there's a little hidden oh, yeah. face gets me going. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I already feel like these are way better than what I did. <laughs> Wait till the um, deadline and all the graphic designers wake up that morning and go, okay, I have to actually finish this. <laughs> yeah. The deadline is here. Yeah. So I know, I know there was like a palette to work to as well, which mm. is why they sort of, sort of all feel really nicely unified. I can't wait to see them in motion as well. Um, I think they're going to be great once they're all sort of, oh, this one's great. That's amazing. <laughs> it's so I'm getting good. a SpongeBob square totally. vibe. Totally, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's awesome. Is that a vacuum or a shaver? I don't know what that tool is. Like a razor? Yeah. The head so of a it's razor? like a razor. It's yeah. awesome. So good, you guys. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> Hug it out. Hug it out. <laughs> it's fantastic. Nice. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love I love that that U. It's such a lovely, playful idea, mm. turning the two ends of the U into two people hugging. It's great. Um, that's like perfect, perfect sort of design for me, like pulling out one little element like that and giving it its own little story. Mm. I think is amazing. Wow, there's some incredibly evolved stuff in here, which is great. Amazing. I quite like this guy. I used a lot of nice smileys over, <laughs> <laughs> over the years. Very um, cool. Yeah, so much good stuff. I mean, really impressive. Oh, this is more of that person. <laughs> that, that, this style is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Can we go up to that pixel, that one? Just This oh, one? No, back down one. Oh, sorry, I'm fast yeah. scrolling. Uh, okay. That one, yeah, I want yeah. to see okay. Yeah, great. That's cool. Yeah. So good. So I wonder how, yeah, again, I, I bet there's some really great ways for extruding this sort of stuff. So where I would have in the past either used my blending method or something, mm. but I'm sure there's a really, a really good, I know there's like some, Pretty amazing 3D stuff in Illustrator now. I've never really dived into it. I guess, I guess that's what's re been really interesting with Adobe Live is almost every time we have someone on, they're like, okay, disclaimer, I'm sure there's other ways to do this, but <laughs> yeah. this is the way I do it. Yeah. And I always love it because it, it, it really doesn't matter how experienced they are. If they're as experienced as you are using the tools, you know, for a long time, or even someone that's fairly fresh, like maybe someone that's a bit, a bit newer, like five, you know, eight years in, mm. and they still always disclaimer. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sure that I'm going against the the design process, but this is how I do it. Yeah, you know. Well, and that's what makes it such a good. Like when I started, and I think sort of, oh, this almost comes back to the question about learning the skills. Like I feel, I often feel so lucky that I started designing when I did, where all this software had, you know, a fraction of the capability that it has now. So learning how to use it meant learning ten things, not learning. A right. thousand things um, and, and sort of knowing where the boundaries of it were was a lot easier. Um, whereas now I, I often feel like oh, what a challenging process to have to dive into this now. Yeah. Um, but I still think that, you know, the, the lovely part of it is 
that you can still mess around with all of it and you're not going to break anything and you just you know you figure out like you say you figure out your path through it as mm. well and that um that you know i think the testament to it being good software is that there are so many ways to do the same thing means that you sort of find out how to do one thing and then make a mistake doing that another day and you figure out some other totally different random thing. It's actually a great mm. it's a great piece of artwork that I saw, or saw somebody made and I think it was made with the blending thing which said something like mistakes, amazing mistakes or something and the amazing, all the letters sort of turned into one another and it's like oh, wow. clearly evident that they just messed up. And <laughs> 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 but it's like such a great piece of work. I love this as well. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Really great. I, I had played it similarly a lot with this diagonal there's a really great lesson for designing for album covers from hypnosis which they did to our record covers was their design thing and I, it's like the one design rule that stuck with me forever where they wrote something like uh, it took them 10 years to realize that a diagonal line on an album cover always was good oh really <laughs> yeah. oh, it's just a... diagonal divisions were great all the time oh wow and even though i le- i was told that it took me maybe another nine years to start actually employing the diagonal line because really? it always feels i don't know why it felt like a weird used to making everything like balance you know balance mm. in a nice neat way but i love that wow um, yeah it's so awesome. much good stuff well, we're starting to run out of time. There's been some great questions. Thank you, everyone, for joining in the chat. Um, definitely check out um, the Adobe Lyrical Masters campaign. We'll share a link. So um, if you're watching the replay, head over to Adobe APAC Live, um, and there, there'll be a link there available. Or if you're on YouTube, just down in the chat, we'll link to the competition as well. Um, do you have any parting advice for someone that hasn't submitted anything yet? Uh, Maybe they just, haven't. Yeah, just do it. Just do anything. Submit any little thing. I think it doesn't, you know, don't worry about how evolved you think it is or how, whether you think you've put enough time into it. Just, you know, do something and send it off and see what happens. I think, like, so many of my good opportunities have come out of stuff like this when I was younger, you know, and yeah. just giving it a go and having it, having a shot at it. Um, yeah. That's perfect. So give it a go, chat room. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, Jonathan Zawada. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun. It was great. See you guys.